Jared Poland, Fronosphoto.com. And this is a special edition of Flying Solo where we talk everything. The Fronos Photo Guide to Video Editing that we've been working on for quite a while, but we put out the call to get your questions so we could deliver you some solid information as well as update you on everything about the guide. I got Todd here. What's going on? I'm very good. I'm, I'm really excited to just talk about it now. Because we, we've been working on this for nearly a year. The biggest, most gigantic guide we've ever created. And uh, I'm just super happy to kind of be at this point to talk about it. Yeah, this, this is one of those things that when we set out to do guides, it, we don't know how long they're going to be. Nope. We don't know how much information we're going to actually pack in there. And it's not about, hey, let's make an 18-hour guide. This guide so happens to be nine hours but it's nine hours of solid freaking information. And on Facebook, I put out the request for you guys to ask questions, not just saying like, it's not just an advertising pitch for the guide, though. This is a big pitch for the guide. If you guys get any value from what we do when the guide comes out, go ahead and pick it up. But we ask questions that are actually, or we asked for questions and you guys responded with some really awesome questions that we're going to help deliver some value uh, right then and there. Yeah. And the nine hours isn't like, all nine hours, like nonstop, learn, 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 learn. It's it's about two and a half hours of educational, learning the language of editing, and then it's four 90-minute sections where we get hands-on with specific types of videos that you may want to edit, like a music video or a short film and things of that nature. So it's long. It's the longest guy we've ever created, but it's bite-sized pieces. Yeah, and, and what I love about it, and then we're going to jump into these questions, is that we're including the footage, the we call it raw footage, but it's it's proxy media, which we explain everything about sure. that in the guide. But that means, say, the music video that we did from the DSLR video guide, we're including the raw footage from that. So you can not only watch Todd edit it during the video, during the, the during the video editing guide, but you'll then be able to take the raw footage and cut it up any which way you see fit. Like yep. if you didn't like something that Todd did, oh, maybe he should have stayed longer on that angle yep. of Jared or use Jared jumping and kicking the barrel instead of Jared jumping and punching the barrel or yep. whatever it is. You have that footage. That's what makes this guide so unique is that not only do we deliver you all of the information in a fun and informative way like we've always done, but we also give you the footage to play with, which so many other institutions don't include that. And we also did an exclusive shoot where we did a short film called Flower Power. Flower Power. That is specifically built for this guide to really accentuate and highlight all the techniques that you learn. Yeah. So you can really be like, oh, I have to do a cross cutting. I have to do this kind of cutting. And you can do it because that's how that specific thing was structured just for this guy. So there's five different video projects that you can actually edit. Nice. So you want to get into these questions? Fire away. Let's see what we have here. The first one is from Daniel Gonzalez. Will this guide be for someone who never edited any kind of video or for someone with some experience? <laughs> I would say if, unless you're an editing pro that's been doing this 25, 30 years, 20 years like myself, it's definitely for everybody below that. Whether it be a beginner, somebody that's just started, or somebody that's got a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of experience, you're going to be able to learn something and take it to the next level. If you don't know anything, we start you from the very beginning. If you've got some experience, we build on those on that knowledge that you know. Right. I also want to say that even if you're an advanced amateur or I mean I'm not I don't I don't even consider myself an advanced amateur neither do I because <laughs> thank you Todd <laughs> uh, th because I know I learned so much by watching Todd during the editing guide that I picked up things that I never would have known that are aha moments that trigger off in my brain when I'm sitting there editing now like the one thing I was doing a video the other day and I was I was actually explaining it to Noah I was showing him why I did a cut when I spin from my one camera at the desk to the computer. Yeah. And I used to do a dissolve. Right. And Todd right. said, stop doing the dissolve. Dissolve means a passage of time. All you're doing is spinning from your one camera to the other camera. Just jump it. Just do a hard cut. Yep. Right. And and so, so I would say even the advanced amateurs that are, even if you've been doing it for a bunch of years, there's probably learning that you will pick out of this guide that will be well worth the value that you have to pay for. It's going to return its value well beyond. It, it definitely will. And, and keep in mind, a lot of the stuff we discuss and we're probably going to talk about this in the future here, is not necessarily the button push-ins. It, it, it's, it's program agnostic. Yep. You can use any program and utilize what we talk about and teach anywhere. 
Yeah. So, so I, w- I would say if you're a beginner, this is absolutely for you. If you have your, if you have the, the, the last guide on DSLR video editing or just video, uh, sorry, on video shooting, this is a great compliment to that. And so you as a beginner will, you're learning the fundamentals, just like my original video guide. We hit the fundamentals and we talk about in the guide that these are the same things that have been happening for a hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Editing a hundred years ago is in essence, you're doing the same things that they created a hundred years ago today. And, to- I, and, and I would say if you've been editing for two, three, four, five years already and you're comfortable with it, you're going to learn a little bit more because there are things that I learned over the last 20 years that I just spill out into this guy. Yeah. And in the hands-on stuff, there are problems that we come across and, and little uh, roadblocks that we have to get over. And you see it happen right in front of your eyes, the, the way that all the mentality and the fundamentals can be utilized no matter what gets thrown at you. And I always say if you can, always, if you can take at least one nugget of information that triggers something in your brain that adds more value to your arsenal, then it's been worth the price of admission. But I say it with all guides. We have a 60-day money-back guarantee. You can buy it. You can download it. If you feel that you're well advanced and beyond it, then we'll give you a refund. Uh, Next one, Surfin Martinez Fro and Todd. Is the guide going to be for owners of programs like Final Cut, Adobe Premiere, etc.? Or is the team going to touch a touch basic editing principles that can be applied to programs like iMovie, Movie Maker, or any other free internet download editing program? Is this guide for beginners? Blah, blah, blah. We already actually just answered the, the last part. But the yeah. first part, programs. Yeah, I mean, program-wise, we utilize Final Cut X um, just because I felt like that's probably the easiest uh, entry-level prosumer program that a lot of people might have access to. But again... You can utilize everything we teach across nearly every program out there. Yeah, the, the the point that we went with when we were discussing, oh, should we, which programs should we pick to use? And we got to the point where like, you know what? We're not teaching you how to use the program. You can learn the buttons and, and it's not about button pushing, which a lot of guides are out there. It's like, oh, this is how you use Final Cut. This is how you use Premiere. This is how you use iMovie. They all are the same. And that doesn't, knowing those buttons does not make your edits better. Right. It's about the theories and mentalities that go through it. So that's why basically it doesn't matter what editing program you have, whether it's the most expensive one in the world or the least expensive one, or even if it's free, it's the theories and mentalities that we're teaching that you can take with you from program to program to program. Uh, I mean, I started using iMovie when I started the website yep. and I knew nothing about what to do other than put an intro in and put an outro in and use some of their fades and dissolves that are fine. Sure. But now I know why I use certain ones and where the, oh my, when, when we were making this damn thing and I'm sitting there because that's what it's about. I was the amateur guy and Todd was, is the expert and I'm standing there and he's like, oh, let's talk about a J cut and an L cut and he's explaining it to me and I'm like, oh, well, darn it. Or a match cut. All of those different things, like a match cut to the door. I'm just like, oh man, this makes sense. I'm like, now it's making sense. And that's the stuff, I get excited about it, but it's the same thing when I taught the the beginner guide stuff. Once you know the fundamentals, they don't change. You yeah. can learn any program. You, once you learn this stuff, it doesn't matter how often the program changes, what new programs you buy all these fundamentals will translate no matter if you start editing on a new editing program or you go and you want to cut film, all this stuff works the same way. Yep. All right, here we go. Julian Bright. Hey, Todd, why did it take you so damn long to edit it? (laughs) P.S. You are Uh, awesome. I would say we had probably 50, 60 hours of footage. We added multiple extra, extra cameras this time. And it was, yeah, we had one, two, three, four, five cameras rolling uh, and then screen. Just so much stuff going on. And at the same time, it was a lot of content. We had a lot of teaching to, to do. Like I said, the first two and a half hours is just educational. So you can get up to speed and know the language of editing so that when we get hands-on, you know exactly what I'm talking about because we've discussed these term- this terminology and the reasons we do certain things. So when you see it in practice, you'll be like, oh yeah, I totally can follow along instead of talking over people's heads with overly technical jargon. So it, it took you long because generally speaking, a feature film takes you how long? An hour and a half feature film should take how long? A 90 minute feature film would maybe take you two, three months is generally a standard. So <laughs> this was f- multiple. So this was t- Yeah. So t- it, this taking like me about nine months to, to edit 
nine hours, I feel, is, is an accomplishment as well. But well, Which means you took the first three months off, didn't you? Oh, I, I had a lot of video games to play. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, the, the, it, was, it was a lot of footage to edit, and it was big. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that the, that the information was being properly communicated. And, you know, there's a lot of things that pop up on the screen to help um, uh, drill down on certain points. Yeah. We've got different examples that pop up just because I, I want people to get it and be able to walk away and be like, you know what? I think my edits are going to be better now. Yeah. So. It, it, and just to get it right. Yep. Todd Metzger, will there be an access to the experts feature that could be purchased along with the new guide as was available with the prior video guide? So for anybody that doesn't know, is if you purchase the, what's that one? The Frono's Photo Guide to DSLR Video. That's that. If you purchase that one, after you made the purchase, there was a secondary offer that said, hey, would you like to sign up for a mentorship program where you can send in questions if you have issues with shooting video uh, or or you wanted to know things and and we had that there and so we decided again that we're going to do that again but this one's going to be more extreme because it's they're going to get your notes yeah i mean you're it's basically like having a director or an executive or a producer look over your your edit and give you notes as to what will make that better um I, I've had that happen with directors and producers I've worked with. It's always helpful. Sometimes you push back and you're like, you know what? My, my way is better. But it's always great to have a second set of eyes. And it's always great to have an educated, talented set of eyes. Not to say that I'm super educated or talented, but to have a, a, a reliable set of eyes look well, at your project and give you notes as to how to make it better. It's kind of similar to when Steven's editing one of the longer five-minute portraits and he calls you or sends you a message and says, hey, what do you think I should do here? Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about. And and so after you purchase when the guide's available, after you purchase the guide itself, there's going to be another option after it that says, would you like the mentorship program, which will give you access to uh, Todd, where you can send in... What, what did we say? how long the video was i think we're going to allow people to uh submit videos up to 30 minutes and have two rounds of notes per project um and that should usually get you into a really good place because what you'll usually do is you'll do a rough cut send it out to your uh your client or your producer and they'll give you notes and then you recut it and you uh send them out the final cut you might get a couple more notes after that and then you're really that's the end of the line for you so that should be that should be very helpful to people because i know as an independent filmmaker when you're on an island all by yourself and you can't have that educated story well, discussion separ- yeah. with, a, with another editor it can be it can be difficult and that's and that's not just a one-time thing that's not just for one thing that's for a year so we're going to do it as a year mentorship program you can send in uh like todd said you're working on your project you have some questions you send over the clips gives you answers and it's great feedback and it's going to save you a ton of time and make the make the product better and sometimes when you're so deep into a project to have somebody look at it from uh you know fifty thousand feet and see, you know, see it a little differently than you can be very helpful. All right, moving on. Andres Graham. I'm just missing your air horn, Todd. I know. <laughs> I keep wanting to hit the button. <laughs> can you and Todd give any tips on color grading? Is there a recipe? Right now, I'm just doing some up and downs with the exposure, exposure saturation in Final Cut Pro. And will there be a chapter in the guide which will take us through? Start with your recipes for that. Um, I mean, again, you know, you deal with the saturation, the exposure, and the color. Those are the basics you're going to have throughout all programs. And when we wanted to be program agnostic, we didn't want to get too deep into external programs, anything like that that's going to uh, require more uh, education and things like that. It's, these are very basic color correction tips. But, you know, where I always start with color is trying to make sure whites are white. I start there, get the color right, then I'll tweak exposure. I might, I might pull the blacks down a little bit to give it a little more kick. I know, I know even with photography yourself, you like to have really deep, rich contrast and, and, and uh, blacks in your, in your shots. It tends to translate as well with video, and uh, that's kind of the basics I do. And we touch on a lot of that, and you see it in the hands-on where we have a problem with um, the, uh, the lighting. We've got daylight in one shot, and then we've got tungsten in another. Oh, really? And they don't match. So, I, well, because when we were shooting it, I was in a rush and I didn't change the white balance. So one of them's a little orange. So I have to correct to make sure the pins, the bowling pins are actually white instead of orange. So we go in and we make that correction. And you see that hands-on, like, you know, why that's important. Now, look, and we talk about this in the guide, you know, 
If it's a feature film and it's a really large, extensive thing, you may send off color correction to uh, an outside source. Uh, color correction and external third-party color correction programs can be very intense, but what we deal with is utilizing the tools that are within these programs. Yeah. And it's it's a very simple thing. Exposure, saturation, color, uh, contrast. I know it's cool when, I, when I've seen some of the pros do it and they have this whole color console board and they're really messing with it. Look, look up some of that stuff. It's pretty cool. Yep. So uh, let's move on. We've got Wilford F. Nazario, the great and almighty Todd and Fro. What is the best way to show off your video editing skills to either a client or to a future employer? That's a good one. Um, well, I will say, see, this is what's tricky. And you and I talk about this when we look for editors, a lot of times, you know, an editor can easily throw up the m most epic shots that they've ever worked on and all. And to me, I'm like, oh, that's a really great reel for the cinematographer. Right. But I don't know anything about you as an editor. Cause you showed me five shots where I feel the rubber hits the road is with dialogue is if you can cut dialogue, whether it's an interview or a narrative like a short film or something, I feel like that's where an editor's timing really shines through. I feel like poor editors can kind of mask things with a music video because you can almost get away with anything there. Yeah. But cutting dialogue with an interview or with a narrative situation, I think really kinds to help shine how your timing, how your eye, how your rhythm really is. Now, as far as um, a company that you want to send it to, See what their bread and butter is. If they're a commercial person, have sharp commercials. If they're a music video thing, you know, maybe steer it towards whatever they like. But for me personally, I always ask for people to send me um, something that they cut with dialogue. That's interesting because I was just thinking, uh, you put it on YouTube, <laughs> and you can put it on YouTube. Well, that was just I was, but that was you. You actually answered it the way it should have been answered. Is I, I didn't get it that way, but now that I do, it, it makes total <laughs> sense. Show show what you do. Don't just show awesome shots that the guys got yes. because that doesn't showcase you. Exactly. All right. Ben Nicolaia or Nicolaiai. Music. My crutch is finding and adding music to my videos that has the right feel, tone, rhythm. Yeah, there's the rhythm of the night. The night. And really... Hey. <laughs> edit <laughs> and really where to find music and sound effects download smile emoticon um so well well i mean there's third party places you you could go shoot b-roll or you could go to like third party websites and download b-roll and uh extra extra music and sound effects and stuff like that yeah we we talk about audio blocks during the video guide quite heavily video blocks during the guide quite heavily and for the people that do pick it up there is a special offer just for you guys that's inside the guide you'll see it when you pick it up but in terms of music it's it's knowing when to put that in there yeah, that's true, and we definitely touch on a variety of different ways to use music in the guide, whether it's background or in a music video or setting a scene up or scoring, um, but it, it's a very powerful way to sell your illusion well, and your edit. Yeah, and, and I remember when we picked the wrong music to lead into a scene, we're like, nah, that doesn't feel right, yeah. and it's just also a part of a feel, so we had a bunch of different tracks that we picked to go over one of the scenes, and we're like, nah, that one doesn't feel right, and then we hit the right one, and we're like, and we lit yep. up. We lit up. We were like, oh my goodness. It's, yeah. it's really just go with a feel. Yeah, yeah. You got to feel it out. Yeah. Now, now as, as far as what he's saying, what I can kind of see between read between the lines there is he probably has a program that has built-in music and he's probably tired of you using that yeah. stuff, and he hears it on every other commercial. Definitely a, a service like Audio Blocks, where you can get uh, additional music for a, a pretty inexpensive price, is a great way to go. I, I utilize a service like that because I like to be unique. I like I like to have different stuff than every other editor has out there. Yep, yep. And going into the into that catalog is really important. Yep. Daniel W. Johnson, I have Final Cut X or Final Cut Pro X. X. Is motion an essential piece of software? Uh, it is an essential piece of software if you dabble into a lot of special effects, uh, green screening, uh, different kind of graphic stuff. It can it can be important just like After Effects if you do a lot of motion tracking and a lot of uh, heavy intensive graphical special effects things. We don't necessarily do that in this guide. This is more about honing your skills as an editor, not necessarily a, a special effects, a visual effects editor. That's definitely a different genre and a different set of skills sure this is more of a core set of skills that would be a great foundation if you wanted to eventually become a visual effects guy well and, and that's the thing is you, you 
you know, you, you learn the fundamentals and then you pl- start playing around with these other softwares. But once you have the fundamentals down, that opens you up to access these other programs. And in the guide itself, we definitely dive into things that you can do in the visual effects realm that you can do within the programs themselves that are very helpful and things that you most commonly do. Yep. You don't necessarily need to go to, to an external program to do a lot of these things. Right. And I want to remind you guys you can go to fronosphoto.com slash video hyphen editing hyphen guide to get more information. If it's still a countdown clock, it's on its way. Just wait till the clock runs out. Then you can get previews of the guide. And if it's already up there, you can go ahead and pick up the guide right meow. More? Yeah. Give All me right. More. Hold on. I'll give you more. Hit me. Hit you. Uh, okay. Steve Blumberg. I have a large documentary style project coming up this summer that will span multiple days, about 26 people in many locations. I'm a bit a bit overwhelmed at the thought of how to organize all my files. So my question would be, what are tried and true organizational styles for all of the wide, medium, and close videos for multiple days slash subjects slash locations? Question mark. So he kind of answered his question a little bit organizing into coverage is definitely one way you may want to do it now it sounds like to me you've got all these people you would you would probably organize in in terms of groups of people that are telling similar stories because at the end of the day as an editor you're a storyteller so you want to organize the best way to tell that story So if the story is uh, somebody going to the grocery store and then what happened at the grocery store, maybe group all the people that talk about the journey into one folder and then have everybody at the final destination in one folder. That's definitely a way to do that. Cutaways to like opening the door. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have all your B-roll and cutaways as people talk and you jump around from interview to interview to let them tell the best story in little bite-sized pieces. Another thing that I do with when I do um, interview situations is I'll lay out everybody's interview one at a time, and then I'll just cut through and, and narrow it down to the most essential sound bites of them giving the very best information that relates to the story I'm trying to tell. And then once you start doing that, you're going to start picking up patterns in everybody's answer, and they start answering themselves. And then you can mentally say like, oh, this guy's talking about crossing the street Oh, he talked about crossing that same street over here. Oh, awesome. I'm going to put those two together. So when once you start whittling, it can be so overwhelming. Once you start whittling down those interviews to the core storytelling elements, you're going to start seeing patterns, and then those patterns will help to tell the story back and forth so between the people. organization is really important. That's huge. I mean, that's we start off the guide talking about organization, organization, whether it be on your hard drive with your raw footage or once you get it into the program, having it in bins, having it in folders yeah. um, is essential because then you can focus on being creative and not being a detective and trying to yeah. find that that one shot that you're like, I know it's there. I saw it last week. And you're watching back from the beginning looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, so organization's important. Yep. Dane Ward, what type of audio format do you use? Wave, MP3. What type of audio editing do you do if you are running lav mics? Um, normally, I would recommend, you know, do like the highest quality, like a wave format or an AIFF, because um, some programs don't, don't, some programs don't necessarily play well with MP3s. Some do. It's a little better nowadays. But some of them don't like to, like MP3. So, if at all possible, I generally just always try to go to the to the best quality, a WAV format or or an a, uh, AIFF, just to be safe, just so it doesn't give it uh, cause any problems within the program. Um, and what kind? What was the second part it of the question? It is what type of audio editing do you do if you're running a lav mic? But in general, what type of audio editing do you do? Um, in terms of editing. I mean, a lot of times when you're editing, I, I tend to do a lot of crossfading between room tones between the two just to make them sound like they're seamless. So when you cut from one camera to another and you might be taking out an um or an ah or, uh or a pause, it seems more seamless because, oh, yeah. because you're crossing the room tone. You never cross the stream, though. No, not, not the streams, but cross that room tone before and after. Um, the segments and it will sound a lot more natural because I'm sure you know maybe you've edited stuff before and you'll hear like a pause or a break in the sound and it's not like the sound you don't hear but you hear like a lack of room tone that becomes a sure sign to the audience that a cut was made and if you're trying to make it seem seamless yeah crossing that room tone is huge for audio and I think we did a whole section on taking out ums 
Oh yeah, for sure. Especially with the interview stuff. That that's a that's a big big thing. Because what I noticed normally is in an interview situation, and even with us talking candidly here, as people think about things, they'll be like, um, uh, and then they'll give an answer. And then a lot of times after people give one big, long winded answer, like I like to give, they may come back and actually give you a short, concise answer. And then you can pick and choose which is best, but you don't necessarily want to have both. So you might pick a little bit of the big, a little bit of the small, cut them together, but cross that uh, room tone and it'll sound like it was one coherent thing. And he sounds like an amazing, brilliant person. Somebody should make a guide about this. It would be really helpful. Sweet. I think we did. Cool. All right. Nathan Marden, greetings programs. That's that's a Tron reference. A what? A what? Tron reference. Oh, that's where it's from. Nice. Thank you for all the great content. What's the absolute best way to get the best sound and have it synchronized? Uh, the, the best way to get the best sound is have a really good sound guy. <laughs> um, I mean, this that's more of a video production standpoint. Um, as far as having the best sound in your project, make sure that your levels are all uh, at the proper places, you know, like dialogue, negative 6 to negative 12 below the top of your meter. Which we is, talked about in the last guy. We talk about every type of sound and how you should level that out. Um, and then beyond that, you know, you can EQ some stuff. You can, you can put um, some compression on some stuff. You can do limiters to kind of even out the highs and the lows of as people are speaking. But... It really comes down to the very, very best sound should happen on set. Now, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, the EQing, the compression, is honestly us doing things to fix sound that isn't necessarily up to where we would like it to be. Gotcha. And that's what happens as an editor. Sometimes it's your, it's your job to shine sugar. Shine sugar? Shine shoes. Shine shoes. Shine shoes. Jordan... Quantiro. Hey, Fro, Steven, and all that is not Todd. Joking. Well, Steven, this is different. Didn't you know that this was going to be a different well, flying... Z- over oh, there. Yeah, he's over yeah, there. He's oh, well. looking at but he's really not talking. weird. Uh, Todd, joking. Much love for Taco Bell, Becky. My question is how to deal with missing a shot that you can't get again. Are there editing tricks that could save either missing shots or messed up shots? Thank you all. Love the show and appreciate how much content you guys give away. Um... Now, missing a shot, if it's, if it's trying to cut around what you have, hopefully B-roll can save the day. Cut away to something, cut back to what, where it picks up in the story. If you're missing an entire story element and you cannot tell the story because an interviewer didn't talk about it, um, I would say you could possibly do again, do the B-roll thing. And if you can't do a pickup shot, maybe you could get a little voiceover from the person saying what they meant to say. 2.5. And then you could put B-roll over top of that. A lot of, the, a lot of that stuff can be solved with a little bit of B-roll, maybe a pickup shot, maybe a little audio piece that you could pull from somewhere else or maybe record. Um, but sometimes at the end of the day, and we have this conversation, you may have to have a conversation with the producer, director, maybe it's yourself. We need to do a pickup day and get something that we did not get. So if it's a story element, it might be a little more complicated. If it's just getting from point A to point B and cutting something out in the middle, B-roll is your best friend. You know what's funny? With, with photography, you, the last thing you want to hear is we'll fix it in post. I don't want to hear that no. because if you don't have it in the can, you really, you're not going to get much better in post. But when it comes to video editing and all the things that we talk about in the guide, it's really where a lot of stuff is saved. The, the unbelievable thing is I've seen what you've pulled out of footage that I've given you in the past that were for you had no idea what it was like the South by Southwest video oh, right. with the uh, with automatic fire, or whichever band I was with and the American dream, video. the American dream video. And, and I just handed you a whole bunch of raw footage and somehow you were able as the editor to build a story from what was there with there was no story that, and that I was created. documentary style, similar to what the guy asked me. Yeah. And I just organized that stuff into sections. I saw you guys at rest stops. I saw you guys on the road. I saw them at venues and I just grouped them all together. And then I was like, Oh, it's a road trip story. And then I just started piecing that together as such. And that's, and that's where an editor, it being a great editor, just being an editor that, that can save somebody's butt is going to add so much more value to your worth, um, that it's worth the price of admission. And understanding that you are a storyteller. 
with this. This isn't just a technical skill of pushing buttons. You're not a factory worker. You are an artist that is actually helping to tell a story in the very best way possible. Right. That's why we're not teaching button pushing. No, no. I mean, look, that's what the uh, the help or the search button for is in every program. Oh, where do I how, where do I find the blade tool to cut my footage? Search search in your program, but we talk about how, why and how you use that which tool. Which is more important. Which is way more important than what specific button to push. Yep, absolutely. Barry Hughes, are you going into details on how to get the best baseline for your footage since there is no way to do raw on most DSLRs? And obviously, then how to get the best from that footage and once you've imported, converted to ProRes or leave as is? Okay, so that's it's a little bit of a two-parter there. Um, and some of that deals with what people did on set. Now, as an editor, you should understand what they might do on set. They might not shoot raw. They don't do that, but they might shoot in a certain picture style. Mm. So they might shoot flat where the colors are very flat and it, and it, it gives you a lot more information to do color correction in post. Um, but I don't necessarily like to get footage that way. I'd rather have it kind of baked in the way they want to see it, the way it's meant to be unless they're going to pay me a, a lot more for a lot more time to do the color correction. So that's that raw question, like you can't shoot raw in video, they might shoot a different picture style, flat or saturated, and that's how they'll deliver it to you. That's something that happens on set. You might have to cope with it as an editor, but... That is just is what it is. Or, now, on, or on the higher end, they may be shooting red raw or something along those lines. And, and at that point, even even still there, they, they'll shoot flat so that you can have the most information in post to color correct everything. Yep. I'm not a big fan of that unless I've got the budget to have somebody color correct it. Um, now, he, he said about converting it and transcoding it and ProRes stuff. Now, that is super important as an editor. You're probably... No, you're not even probably. You're not going to edit your feature film in 4K, 8K, 10K. You're just not going to do it. Your computer's going to crap out with such a large format project. You're going to have proxy media, which is little tiny versions of that footage that will reference the high-res footage when you want to export it, but your computer will use the tiny versions just so it can get through it. And and that comes down to, you know, really just helping your computer survive this process. And that's how we're delivering you guys the the quote-unquote raw footage that you get to edit and play with. We had to make it proxy media in order to send it to you because we weren't going to send 50 gigs of footage in 50 gigs of footage. Instead, it's like, what, four gigs or so? Yeah, it's about it's about four gigs. And it's still a good quality looking. It's just the bit rate's a little more compressed just so we can get it to you. And, you know, people's computers won't be taxed by what we give them. And that brings us to the next question. Peter, or sorry, Pete Stovall. What is the basic computer requirements to do video editing? My nine-year-old laptop would drive me crazy trying to edit a video on. Can I get this one? Sure. Th- this is something like, look, you know in this day and age, if you are video, if you're editing video, if your computer has trouble with raw files when it comes to photos, it's definitely going to have trouble when it comes to trying to do video. And now as more video, as the video gets larger and larger with 4K and beyond... You, you need a computer. You need a computer that's going to be able to keep up with it. We're not saying that... You, know, you just have to be aware of that. It's not like you can use your nine-year-old computer to edit video. It's just not going to work. And you look, if you're on a budget and you've got a computer that's a few years old, three, four, five years old, you have to just understand what you are capable of at that level. You can't maybe edit a 90-minute project because your computer's not going to be able to process all that at one time. Maybe you break down your movie. If it's a movie, maybe you cut little scenes and then you export each one of the scenes and then you piece them together. You should save it back to the tape. And then put the tape back on the, until you build it kind the old of, way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you spit out each one of those sections as just one, one file, and then you can butt all them up. Um, and you know, you're not going to probably edit 4K with an with a, with a older computer. Just understand what you have yeah. and make those choices when you're shooting. Here's something interesting today as well, is that even if you're not doing a massive project and you have a phone or a tablet, one of the, some of the newer ones are capable of doing the edits that we're talking about. The fundamentals and theories you can do in on a tablet and on a phone. Now, you just have to know the limitations of what you have there, sure. but most everybody has an updated phone. If you have an iPhone or you have some kind of Android that's fast, yep. you can edit video on it. Yeah, I, I, but I would... It's going to be harder. I yeah. would think if they've got a computer from the last five years or so, I mean, they could probably do some very basic editing. 
shorter shorter projects and not really have a problem with it. But know know what your computer is capable of doing before you accept the project or before you shoot one. Yep. Adam C. Lebray. Hey, Todd. Hey. I recorded an interview that has has one long audio track. Would it be more efficient to clean it up in Adobe Audition as one long audio track before I sync and edit it in the video? Or should I clean it up after it's edited into multi audio, multiple audio clips in the timeline? That's a good question. He answered it. Yeah. Oh, he did? Fix it first. Fix that big, long track. <laughs> even it out. So let me guess. So you don't have 27 different clips you're trying or to figure out where everything goes? Like 100 different clips, and you're trying to pick and choose like which one's which. Now, look, you might need to go in and finesse one or two clips because maybe they're significantly uh, lower or louder or something, which is fine, but it's way easier to, to correct and deal with sound at the very beginning in the big chunks. And we talk about that in the guide even with syncing sound. Sync it all at the beginning so that you don't have to go through your entire edit then bit and piece and try to piecemeal your sound stuff back together. Or to line it back up. Well, not even line it back up. It's just it can be so painful and and, and confusing at that point because you've got all these cuts, all this stuff you've done, and now you have to be a detective again and figure out where everything is and, and try to remember, do it right at the beginning, get it right, clean up that audio track, sync your sound, and then be creative and, and cut the best story possible. Got it. Yeah, I got it. Good. E- even even when I line up stuff, well, I don't do much cleaning when I'm editing, sure. but I know how to line it up. So when I'm sitting at my computer and I've got the lavalier and then I have the computer audio, right. I yep. line it up manually yep. and then I get rid of the other track that isn't any good and I'm good to go. And you wouldn't want to do that later <laughs> after you cut stuff up? After I cut and trim, I'd be like, no, this is horrible. No, you wouldn't. You want to take care of it right from the beginning. And most all programs, just about all the programs that you're paying money for these days, have the ability to help you line up audio. Do it right at the beginning because yep. you're going to save yourself a ton of yep. time. Uh, let's see. Andrew Isaac. What are the things you absolutely have to get right in camera? And what are the elements? What are the elements are acceptable to correct in post? Thanks, guys. In a perfect world, what should be correct in camera? Focus. Everything. Yeah. Except performance. That's what, in a perfect world, I want everything to be perfect in camera. And all I'm looking for is the best performance or the best information that maybe an interview he's giving me so I can piece that story together. Now, when it comes, you know, bad lighting, bad color, something shifts in the shot, you know, the boom gets rustled and you got to fix sound. It is what it is. There's always little issues with every project you're going to edit. But, um, as a filmmaker, if, if you're ed- if you're shooting and editing, only thing you should leave to post, fix and post, is the performance and the information you're telling your story with. Try to get everything correct in camera. And if you have a client that's bringing you stuff, tell them, try to get everything correct in camera. And what's great is as you become a better and better editor, you can correct a lot more in post as a great editor if you know what you're doing. When you know where to put the B-roll and, and, and where to hide things, because Todd can take a turd and polish it pretty well and, and and i will say um on on the flip side if you are a one-man band filmmaker shoot it edit it once you become more proficient at editing you're going to be a way more efficient filmmaker because you're going to be like you know what i'm done i got exactly what i need i know exactly in my mind right now how i can piece this story together i got what i need i'm moving on or you're not going to have a question like before like oh i'm missing something crap what do i do no you're going to be like oh you know what i don't have this element let's shoot this guys before we leave and wrap this set because i know i'm going to need that in post so being a strong editor is going to make you the strongest filmmaker possible. And we, we talk a lot about this stuff in the guide, how you become more valuable when you are well-rounded, whether you know how to shoot the video, edit the video, and do everything. You add, you bring so much more value to yourself, your price tag goes up. Mm-hmm. And, and you keep, we talk about this, where if, if you are shooting and editing it, and in the past you could just shoot it, you had to ex- send it to somebody else to edit it, you're giving away money at that point. Yeah, they if, probably know what that costs. That's in your pocket then at that point. Right. And then you you just become a more, uh, just a smarter shooter slash editor because either you can save your client money because you can do it all or you can make yourself more money because you can do it all. Yep. Uh, Javier Roquez. Sometimes I feel people abuse B-roll. Is there a rule for how long a B-rolls versus main content should be? Is there a rule? Uh, no. 
It's story and rhythm of the scene itself. So This is the rhythm of the... Exactly. Now, you and I talk all the time, um, like even in this guide, we, when we edit together the review for the camera, and it's your YouTube channel, and I keep cutting to B-roll of the camera, because that's what you're talking about. It's a subject unto itself. You've got to strike a balance between the talking head, which I don't want to watch for five minutes, no matter how handsome you are or how important the client is, nobody wants to watch that talking head for five minutes. You want to cut between back and forth between what they're talking about. If they say it, show it. If they talk about the factory that they work at, show it. If they talk about the camera or a feature, show it. Get in and out of that stuff efficiently. Don't cut too fast, but don't, don't necessarily live on something too long that it becomes predictable and people just start their attention starts to wane it's your job to keep it entertaining keep it moving so just find the balance and the rhythm between the two things to help tell that story even that's just good free information it is it's just that's that's really good information you're all welcome. right yeah you're, you're you're welcome todd i mean thank you todd uh skylar dyer Hmm. What workflow do you use for the first person shooter videos? I got a GoPro for Christmas and would like to make similar videos. Workflow. Oh, that's for me. Or is that for you? Well, I mean, workflow wise, see, when you're talking about a workflow, getting video from a source and editing it, my question would be is how many options do you have? Are you shooting one shot yeah. the whole time? then your options are limited. And, and you're going to probably jump cut through it or you're going to speed it up or you're going to do slow-mo. And then it is what it is. Yeah. But if you've if you got a GoPro, though, do yourself a favor and shoot options. So, you know, if you're riding on a... On a I'm, I'm, for whatever reason, in my mind, I'm imagining like a, a mountain bike. If you're on a mountain bike and you're going POV style, shooting this way and you're getting the trail and all that, then maybe on your way back, turn it around and shoot this way and have an option of you going this way. And then, you know, if you're thinking forward thinking, maybe get a shot of like the mountain you're about to go up just for a couple seconds. Why well, you always think like a shooter and an editor because you're, you're making like, sure you have the footage have you need. Options like options are, are, are an editor's best friend. Well, that's what, so what, what I will say for my first person shooter things, if I am to do it myself and only have a GoPro in the hot shoe is when I'm editing that, I'm making sure that I'm rotating the camera. If So if I go vertical, I'm making sure that I'm rotating that in post so that people aren't sitting oh, there trying to turn their heads. Saying, right. Or I pop in the photos as they're taken and let them well, live on the that, screen. Though, see, with you having photos, That's another you yeah. have an option. Yeah. Now, if this guy's just shooting uh, skateboarding or whatever and it's one shot the whole time, he's going to limit himself. Yeah. So when you're shooting with that GoPro, do yourself a favor Give yourself different options. Right. So perfect information if you have it. Good good stuff, Todd. Let's see. Nicholas Ryan Watts. How do you slow down a clip playback to play in slow motion? Also, how do you speed up a clip to play very fast? Uh, every program out there has some sort of time stretching feature. You can stretch stuff out. You can shrink it so it goes faster. Um, a lot of this also still comes back to how it was shot to get the best slow motion or to get the best speeding stuff up is not so much a problem and you just speed it up. Um, but slow motion, this is generally why people shoot it 60 frames, 120 frames, things in a variable of like 24 frames. So usually movies are 24 frames a second. And then, you know, you'll shoot at 60 frames per second because that's one and a half times 24, thus having a very, very smooth slow motion. Now, you could take a 24 frame clip and force it to be slow motion, but all the program's doing at that point is it's duplicating frames. And that's why you'll see slow motion that kind of looks a little jittery and not really as smooth as movies. That's because in movies and, you know, high end stuff, and just professional looking stuff, they shoot at a higher frame rate to get good slow motion. And we go over all of this in the guide. We do. And now the only other thing I would say is, you know, you could do just a flat, like speed it up, slow it down. Um, but you can also do speed ramps where you go from like zero to 50 to kind of have it start normal and then speed up really quick and then slow back down. Mm. And we touch on that in the guide as well. That's a little special thing. So speed ramps are kind of fun depending on what you need to do. You might need somebody to cross the street a little bit faster to section and then stop so that they can deliver dialogue at the proper speed. So you might do a speed ramp where you specifically key in these things with keyframes, which we get into in the guide as well. You're blowing my mind. Just exploded. Yep. Oh, uh, geez. Karishna Naj Kaleidapan. I should probably edit that pronunciation. I got it right. No, do a voiceover <laughs> in post. 
Christian, I'll have Steven do it. <laughs> <laughs> How to make an interesting teaser slash trailer. Things to consider. Um, consider length. Sometimes I see trailers and teasers for things that people are really proud of, really excited to show the world, and it's 10 minutes. Yeah. And that teaser should be 30 seconds. So consider that. Because it's a lot easier to grab the greatest shots, the greatest plot points, and hopefully you're not spoiling it like so many trailers do, um, to put the greatest things into 30 seconds than to stretch things out for five, 10 minutes. Yeah. Do that. A, a great, great teaser trailer, the audience wants more. So don't give them too much. So keep it clean and concise and get them excited to see more. That's the, that's the, the reason you're doing it. So I would say... Short is short and sweet, but make people want more. Yes, yes. All right, Clark Podger. Does this guide work independently, or do we need any of the others to complement this? You want me to get it? Sure, have at it. I got it. It works fine independently. So if you're just looking for video editing, this is going to be perfect for you. But if you haven't picked up the DSLR video guide yet, and you're looking to really ramp up your video skills, getting them both together are really going to, it's, it's really going to help you out. Well, they, they complement one another. They are. Because well, the f- we because honestly wanted to get them both out at the same time, but that would have, we would have been going forever. Yeah. That, that's the beauty of, of the two guides together is that uh, the videos that you edit and that we, the, the footage we give you to edit is stuff that we showed you how to shoot in the DSLR video guide. So, by having both of them, not only can you know how to edit all these different types, you can see how to shoot all these types. So it's kind of a one-two punch. You can be a shooter, uh, filmmaker, editor, all in one all in one package by having both of them. Right. But again, you don't need both. Not at all. It's great. If you want to support us any other way, you could always pick up the flash guide or the Frontos <laughs> photo guide to getting out of auto. This is honestly the fourth guide we've created, and I've got over 2,100 videos that are free on on the internet yeah, on YouTube true, so true. and over on the website. So, you know, if you want to support us, you can go ahead and do that. But no, you don't need you don't need any of the other guides in order to make this one useful. No, you, if you just want to be an editor, this is the perfect thing to get you started. Just like the DSLR video guide was the perfect place to start if you wanted to get into filmmaking. But they do complement each other very, very well if that interests you from both angles. Sure. Uh, okay, the last one we have here is Nick. Nicole Bolas just wanted to say that I'm reviewing the guide and it's really good. Oh, I bought the video guide and they go together really well. I'd recommend getting the video guide and and watching that first. Super happy with it. I'm already making a video for a local business. So the guide has paid for itself. So we did send out some beta copies to people to get an understanding for. And you wanted to talk about some of the feedback that you got because we create this stuff and you never know how the how the you guys are going to react to it. That's why we get 20 or 30 of them out to people just so that we can get their feedback. Yeah, I think the most exciting stuff that I see from a lot of the the reaction from people is this has demystified editing for me because it can be really overwhelming. You open up that program and there's all these windows and buttons and, and little things to click and you're like, I don't even, I have no idea where to start. So just to get people comfortable with the idea of editing it's really, really simple at the end of the day. The computers only do but so many things. You know, you cut, you dissolve, you wipe, you do uh, things here and there, but it's all based on a lot of the same principles. It's knowing the techniques and the fundamentals of storytelling through the editing process that really helps to take your videos to the next level. And I, what I was super happy to see with a lot of the responses was that everybody was getting that. They're like, holy cow, I look at videos way different now because of this guide. I watch television different. I watch uh, movies different. And I think that's that does a lot for me because that's what we set out to do starting this guide to really bring editing down to a level where anybody can pick it up. Well, and and whether you're a pro, amateur, beginner, the, the same thing we try to do with every guide is to make it fun and informative. And this guide is pretty unique because Todd is the master expert at this and I'm the amateur guy for, the, for something. It's not like we're taking pictures. It's the editing part. I can edit a little bit, 
but that will, that's what's great when you watch this guide is that you're like, oh, I'm like Jared in this situation. Or you may have better skills at editing videos than I do here, but you're still going to pick up a ton of stuff from Todd. I mean, that, yeah, go ahead. Well, some of the best stuff and, and some, of the, some of the reviewers have actually pointed this out is there are a number of aha moments that you have. And as I was piecing the guide together, I was like, man, that really really means something there that you're like, oh, because you'll see, you can see it in your eyes a couple of times. It just clicks and you're like, oh, we were talking about that and that before and now we're doing this and that's why this was relevant and it just, you realize like, oh, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. Like if I have a story to tell, I just use a, a handful of, of techniques and I can really tell a professional looking story through video. Yep. And what and what's cool about the guide when you do pick it up is that you have access to it all the time. You own it. It's like your Bible. It's like the it's like your college class without having to go to college and drop four years of time or two years of time and yep. lots and lots and lots of money that you're just gonna sit in front of a class and they're gonna basically tell you to do the same thing that we're doing, except not in as fun and informative way. And and uh the hands on sections, the editing specific things, we do a music video, we do a commercial EPK, we do a short film, and we do a YouTube channel video. So those are four very, very common things that everybody wants to do. So when you own this, all of a sudden you've got a, a, a music video gig, you're like, oh crap, I, I don't know if I can do that. I've never done one of those before. You can go back, revisit this, get some tricks and tips to not only edit it, but it might spark some ideas on how to shoot it. And it, it's one of those things that it's always going to be there as a resource for you. Yep. Yeah, we're really proud of this bad boy. I mean, that's what we set out to do. You never know how it's going to turn out, but but I, I'm really happy with it. I'm super happy of it. And I'm excited that it's not a passive thing. People aren't just going to watch us, tell them what to do. They can actually go do it. Yep. You're getting every piece of footage that we have, and you can do it better than me. I can't wait to see the things that people do with the footage we provide them and surprise me. I'm going to be like, man, I should have thought of that. Man, that's a better shot right there. <laughs> I, I'm super excited to see like where they take it. And we'll probably have a way for people to do that That'd at be, some point. That would be cool. That would be cool. Would be so really cool. Uh, thank you guys for for submitting the questions hope you got a bunch of information out of this because that's the that's the point of it if you want to get more stuff more information about the guide or pick it up you can go to fronosphoto.com slash video hyphen editing editing hyphen guide aka the video editing guide that's what it's all about and uh you know anything else you want to add before we get out of here i think this is about the time we'll probably fade to black Oh, this is the time you use to fade the black? Probably. The, soon. The probably slow? soon after you're going to probably do an outro. Do an I'll, outro. I'll do a fade but the, again, the cool thing is when you get it and you learned from the nine hours, you can split that up over a, a couple days. You oh, could yeah. binge watch it in yeah. a couple days and you shouldn't be scared away by the fact that it's nine hours because no. you have your two and a half hours plus your hours and a half of, of, of the content. But once you watch this and you start watching movies and TV shows, you're like, up. Oh, that's a jump cut up. Oh, that's a match cut. And you start, you, you're, you're visually getting better and better. So yep. I, that's it, Todd. I'm going to end it. Perfect. All right. So this was a special edition of flying solo, all things video editing and all things promoting the guide, because that's what we're doing. So go check it out. Fronosphoto.com slash video hyphen editing, hyphen, hyphen, hyphen guide. Jared Poland, Fronosphoto.com. See ya.